my name is Iver Östavik. I am working for the Raptor Foundation for Human Rights in Bergen, Norway. And I have the privilege to host this little webinar in partnership with Bergen Global. Um, Bergen Global is a platform created by the University of Bergen and the Christian Mikkelsen Institute, also in Bergen. Uh, RAFTO hands out a human rights prize every year, and we try to assist our laureates afterwards to the best of our ability. Um, Bergen Global uh, works to bring researchers and other stakeholders together in order to understand global challenges better, including how we can and perhaps should act as citizens to meet those challenges. Um, I am very pleased to have with me three eminently placed persons to enlighten us about today's subject, which is the announced presidential election in Poland, its importance for the development of Poland, and Poland's importance for the development of Europe. We have with us uh, first Malgorzata Agnieszka Sindeka, who is herself a Pole living and working in Norway. Um, working as assistant professor at the Department of Law uh, at the University of Bergen. And she specializes on legal matters relating to the economy, including the role of the state. Uh, quite important in these days. Uh, then we have Marta Lempart. Um, she has been among the most significant leaders of the women's strike in Poland, which uh, successfully halted uh, the most draconian abortion law proposed in Europe in our time. And uh, the women's strike are in many ways uh, probably the most sig significant civil society mobilization in recent years in Poland. And ready to meet new challenges. Then we have Wojciech uh, Przybilski, who is author and editor of Visegrad Insight, um, a publication I recommend very highly. It is perhaps the most important outlet to follow for understanding the Near Eastern Europe. All right then, why Poland? Um, very quickly, um, Poland is a large country in Europe. It has close to 40 million inhabitants, meaning it's uh, much larger than the entire Scandinavian area. Uh, Poland is a bridge between many states in Europe. Um, uh, there are a million Ukrainian workers in Poland. Poland is the leading, uh, the most uh, uh, populous and important country among the Visegrad Four, which includes the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. 6.5% of all Poles live abroad in other European countries, including around 700,000 in Germany, uh, also around 700,000 in the UK, 125,000 in the Netherlands, roughly 100,000 in Sweden, Ireland, and Norway. Poles are the largest diaspora community in our country, and their lives and their concerns are not much discussed. Um, why Poland now? Um, there is a presidential election announced in Poland the upcoming Sunday. Uh, how, or even if this election is to take place, is still hanging in the, in the balance. Um, tomorrow, the deadline goes, uh, uh, goes out for uh, the power to postpone legislation about the election of the upper house of the Polish parliament. Uh, it is expected to turn down uh, a proposition to organize a postal uh, vote for Sunday. Then, maybe or maybe not, uh, the election will be carried through in some form or fashion through a decision um, the following day on Thursday. Um, because that is the power of the lower house in Poland. We do not know uh, what will happen. Um, a large majority uh, among the electorate are negatively uh, disposed towards organizing hurriedly a uh, postal vote uh, during the corona crisis. Um, the opposition is anonymously against it. Um, one of the coalition partners of the incumbent government 
is negative to it, uh, the European uh, Union, um, as expressed in uh, statements by the European Parliament and the European um, Commission are against it. Uh, the Council of Europe is against it. And followed on the heels of all these authorities are uh, uh, the dominant part of the legal uh, expertise and the legal uh, professional community in Europe. The question, the question then is both what will happen and what will the consequences be? Okay, um, I'll leave it to our guests to uh, answer as best they can uh, these very tricky questions. And I'll start with our switch to Poland, uh, Olga Sapa. Please, let me hear your thoughts on this very tricky situation. Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, and of course, as a lawyer, uh, well, I have to point out that um, as regards the economic situation in Poland and the businesses, um, we have to remember that if we have a legal framework that is not stable, that is very unclear, that is actually unpredictable, when we have a judiciary system that is, uh, uh, well, being threatened by, by the government, if we actually don't know whether the judgments that are handed down, whether they will stand, whether they are valid, whether or not they will be, will be declared void, there is absolutely no legal certainty for businesses. And it's not only a problem for Polish businesses, but it's also a problem for businesses from abroad. So if we want to have foreign business invest in Poland, it's absolutely necessary that there is no doubt that we have a stable legal framework and that this legal framework is in line with EU law. If we have a situation in which the judges may be punished for asking the EU court uh, about how to interpret EU law, well, it's not going to go. Um, we already have cases in which uh, judges from other member states are denying to, um, uh, to send Polish citizens back to Poland uh, so as they may be prosecuted, because there is uh, doubt that uh, the Polish system, Polish judiciary system is independent. So actually, it's a very shameful situation uh, for uh, for Polish uh, for, for Polish people for uh, for Polish um, government as well. Um, what else can I say? Actually, uh, right now we have a very um, strange situation, very dangerous situation, because the COVID nineteen outbreak is being used uh, to implement law. Um, that is threatening uh, civil rights, that is threatening businesses. Actually, all those limitations are um, contradicting uh, the Constitution. Uh, but as we all know, peace is not really interested in, um, in applying Constitution. They are really um, happy to celebrate Constitution, uh, but they don't care about it at all. Um, so this is also a threat to Polish uh, businesses. Uh, we also have to mention that uh, uh, in relation to this postal vote that, well, we may have it or may not. Right now, it's absolutely uncertain what can happen. Uh, so I'm actually finding out, finding out new things every time I go to Twitter. Uh, situation changes within hours. Uh, so in relation to this uh, vote, uh, uh, the Ministry of Digitalization uh, sent all... Um, data, um, well, data information about citizens uh, to uh, post. Um, so the company that is supposed to make sure that uh, we will have this election by, uh, by voting by post. So, and this is uh, absolutely illegal. There was, there was no legal basis for doing so. Um, this has been, um, well, we have a claim um, to the European Commission. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, but this doesn't change much uh, as regards the safety of, uh, uh, of our uh, personal uh, data in Poland. So I myself, I'm pretty, pretty worried about that. Uh, so actually in every single 
um, area of law. Peace is um, destroying everything that we built uh, from 1989. And this is really, really worrying. And absolutely, there is no, there is no uh, predictability, uh, which is probably most worrying. Hmm. This is a very bleak uh, picture. Do you think, since I, I, I think I should give you a few minutes more, um, uh, do you think you could explain uh, how this may uh, impact on the relations between uh, other European countries who are part of the legal order of the, of the European Union, uh, and by extension also the uh, AOS, the European Economic Area, uh, in which Norway also belongs. Well, of course, it's a very bad signal when it comes to European integration. As the recent polls um, demonstrate, um, uh, we don't have any more this true European enthusiasm. Or actually, maybe this enthusiasm was very artificial. Maybe we actually didn't understood what EU is about. Uh, because uh, it seems that uh, uh, the Polish governments were very happy to uh, take money from, from the European Union, but when it comes to um, complying with the obligations, uh, uh, then we are not the best uh, in the school. So, um, uh, so this is pretty worrying. And um, Poland is, um, is also not uh, one of the member states that um, uh, is really interested in fighting climate change, for example which will be a big thing on the European agenda in the coming years. And the Polish government is really insisting on that uh, Polish economy should be based on coal. Uh, so it has a really, this is only one of the examples, how it actually may affect the European cooperation. Uh, of course, fighting climate change is something which is very expensive. It requires a lot of solidarity, um, sacrifices, uh, and if you have member states that are definitely going in the opposite direction, it's going to be much, much uh, more difficult. And for the EU as such, uh, a member state that is definitely saying that no, we are not going to play according to the rules, because your rules are wrong, but we still want to benefit from being a member, um, this is a signal that may actually be very uh, bad for for the whole cooperation. So as far as, for example, Brexit is concerned, well, we missed a very valuable member, but Poland remaining in the EU may be a source of maybe bigger problems. So the question is how the EU is going to cope with that. Because, the, well, in my opinion, the choice is between either ignoring, ignoring Polish, Poland, um, or just, uh, well, maybe getting rid of Poland as a, as a member. You cannot tolerate a member state that is saying openly that we are not going to, to comply with EU law. Mm. Um, one more question. Um, if you were a Norwegian businessman or responsible for handling a business relation with a Polish counterpart who is either owned by the government uh, or heavily dependent on government approval in some form or fashion, for instance, in the form of licensing or, or uh, access to, to, to other opportunities. Uh, do you think that this, the development in Poland uh, regarding the judiciary uh, uh, and, 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 and the increasing uh, centralization of power is uh, is a danger or a risk for uh, business operators? Absolutely, absolutely. If you cannot trust the judiciary system, uh, I mean, what can you do if things go wrong and you have to go to the court because you have certain disagreements? Mm. So this is a basic rule that you can feel, uh, you can feel safe, uh, that you have this legal certainty. So uh, I'm very sorry to say that, but um, it's not very promising for our Norwegian businesses. Okay. Mm. Uh, disturbing. Um, I think we'll shift to our next speaker. Uh, Marta, you are allowed to talk about whatever is uh, on your <laughs> mind. But I think maybe, I think maybe you could be 
you know, especially valuable to a Norwegian audience to 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 explain how what groups might be uh, particularly exposed to to uh, in a negative way to these changes uh, among Polish uh, citizens. Um, I think it's the same as it has been in the last five years um, because we had the four years of the first term and now it's, it's, it's going into the next term. Uh, so basically it's women, uh, it's uh, LGBT persons, but it's also people. And this is something that, uh, but that, that we don't always remember about uh, people with lower income, people who uh, have financial problems because the, the government does not provide any help for them uh, in spite of the propaganda, how, how it's supporting families and so on. Because uh, the costs of, of living uh, with, the, with the economy that is, is, is not uh, being uh, managed in any competent way, uh, basically uh, makes the, the money spent by the government on supporting the Polish families and, and supporting uh, people uh, quite insignificant because everything is, is much more expensive and uh, many of the benefits that were established before the government came uh, they are still uh, in the they are still there uh, but uh, the conditions that you have to fulfill to get them uh, are uh, are tightening and tightening and tightening and, and it's less and less people who are actually entitled to any benefits uh, and the poverty level is 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 really rising. Um, so with the economic crisis that we have in front of us, uh, I think the biggest group will be the people who lost their jobs. One million people lost their jobs in the end of March. Uh, I think it will be another million in the end of April or maybe or or now. Um, and we have no the, the government has no plan for that, and the government doesn't deal with that in any way. So we're looking at the economic crisis that we've never had uh, since the transformation. And we're looking at the homelessness crisis that we've never had and we never had to deal with because we, we just didn't have it. We didn't experience that um, because first there was the communist times and then during the transformation, we didn't have the homeless problem at, at the range that it's actually coming to us um, with the labor, with people losing jobs and actually will, that, that will actually lose the apartments. So apart from this, uh, I would say human rights issues uh, on this um, level, like major minority groups, women, refugees, LGBT persons. We are looking at uh, also the, the group of even the, the, the peace voters uh, who will be in absolute, absolute uh, um, horrible situation when it, when it, uh, when the pandemia ends or even within the, the pandemic times and they won't be helped because the government is concentrating on pushing the elections, on pushing the restrictions on, civil, on movement, on public assembly, basically anything they can do, they can during the pandemic to, uh, to limit uh, civic rights, civil rights. Uh, and there's no plan to actually deal with, with the uh, the consequences of the of the pandemic, and this is absolutely terrifying. Uh, Pol Poland is basically now in the self help mode, so the government is not doing anything. People are collecting money to buy masks and equipment for the hospitals, to buy food for the uh, frontline workers. Uh, that they create funds to support uh, I don't know people who work uh, in culture or other uh, fields that are not working now. Um, everything is based on self-help and there's no state anymore it's like the state abdicated uh, there are not tests that there are no tests being done to people so we don't know how many uh, people are actually ill uh, it, it has to be much more than the, the government says uh, the frontline workers the the uh, emergency responders are uh, supposed to uh, qualify all the deaths uh, because that might be susp uh, suspicious because of the coronavirus as respiratory problems or heart problems, not to mention the virus. So, so there is this, this, the whole lie that we are in much better state than we actually are. But the most worrying thing for me, as I said, is the fact that when they are concentrated on keeping the power and using this time to limit all the rights, uh, we are 
going fast into the, the biggest economic meltdown that we, uh, we will see in this, I would say, 30 years history. And, and yeah, we're terrified basically because yes, okay, we collect money and we have this, uh, it, it's called uh, visible hand groups in every city, people who, who do everything basically that, that the state should be doing, uh, but it cannot last. We cannot work like this uh, for, for, like forever, I think, uh, because more and more people are losing jobs so they cannot help others because they have to deal with, with their own uh, losses and so on and so on. Uh, we don't have the healthcare system that would work pr properly. Uh, all the people in uh, in the centers, like senior centers and and all the closed uh, centers, are uh, are basically endangered uh, with the coronavirus. But nobody's doing anything, and there are actually cases of, for example, one nurse for 50 patients in in a um, in a senior's home. So. This is this is ab absolutely uh, the, the the situation in which the state is just somewhere else doing some political things, and the society is doing whatever we can to not let so many people die and to to help the frontline workers and the first responders and the emergency responders, and it's really a burden and it's really hard. And on on one hand, we can say that this is this another. Uh, fine story how Polish people are so brave and they can deal with anything uh, but I think we, we are tired already and for once I think many of the people don't want to be heroes and we have to be heroes again we have to be this this heroic society that can deal with anything and this is really bad that we have to do it and and that the fact that we can deal with this and that the fact that we are so still successful and effective in the do, doing with with the pandemia in spite of the government not doing anything about it it also is killing us because it's presented to the international community and it's presented in the propaganda media as the government's success as the the situation in poland is not so bad and it's not so bad because it's the citizens doing that not not the not, not the government so this is frustrating also because this is the choice. If we do something because we have to help each other because, yeah, nobody will. Um, but also we have to this, this, um, uh, this idea of all this work and all this horrible stress and burden uh, that we deal with now be presented as the government's success and the, the proof that Poland is doing well, doing well. Polish society is doing well. In, in terms of uh, dealing with the pandemic, but not, not Poland, not Polish government, not Polish institutions. Local governments are doing well and, and also they are heroes and the, the mayors of the city are heroes. And, but still, it means that they will spend money on, on things that the government should cover, which means less investment, which means uh, worse education and other problems that the cities, the Polish cities will have. Um, and, and local governments will have because uh, they, they fund hospitals which should be funded by the government. They fund, uh, they, they, they just uh, put the money in the holes that are uh, unfulfilled by the government. So this is major, major stress for us, but yeah, we have no other way. But it's not something that we should be proud of or should be praised because it just shouldn't happen. We shouldn't have the state abdicate. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the general thing for me now. Oh, uh, bleak uh, and scary uh, picture of the future. Um, uh, I think I'd like to uh, add a little practical information before I kick the ball over to Wojciech. Um, um, uh, after uh, Wojciech, I'll give all of you a short opportunity to, to, to comment if there's anything in particular said by the other participants that you would like to, you know, to, to add a comment to. Cool. And then I'll open up for uh, questions. Um, um, uh, questions can be uh, posed in the Q&A se uh, uh, section here at, uh, in Zoom, or they can be posted uh, on Facebook. And then uh, our uh, great and friendly uh, contributors from Bergen Global will, will pass those questions uh, on to the um, uh, Zoom interface that uh, the four of us use. Um, 
I guess we uh, it might be useful for some of the listeners to uh, to be reminded that well, what is about to take place now, perhaps the presidential election is uh, uh, is a process going hand in hand with a much uh, longer process of changing um, uh, the judicial system. Uh, and the most recent development uh, on that count is um, uh, the, temp uh, the temporary replacement of the outgoing first president of the Supreme Court. The first president of the Supreme Court, Malgus uh, Gerstov, has been a very fierce champion for an independent judiciary for several years uh, under immense pressure, and she is now uh, leaving her post. Uh, she's retiring, so, uh, so it's uh, how it should be. Uh, uh, this is a very powerful post, uh, influencing how panels of judges are composed to handle uh, critical or delicate issues. Um, so uh, it is likely that the interim first president will, um, will call in uh, to find a new permanent first president very soon. And that this uh, uh, permanent first president will be closely attached to the government party, uh, which it somewhat ironically is named uh, uh, law and justice. Um, so these two, these two moves, uh, assuming control over the judiciary has raised the alarm all over Europe. It is contrary to, to all established norms uh, of uh, separation of powers and independence of, uh, of judicial powers. Um, and then we have uh, the continuation of uh, the powerful posi uh, position of precedent, which Oh, can I, elections are carried through. We'll, 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 we'll uh, extend the can power. I see? Can I say something? Yes, because please, there's please. a new... Uh, I'm, I'm just following the, the news because today is the Senate and uh, they, the, the piece just tried to break the, the Senate's, uh, proceeding, Senate's proceedings, uh, which is totally uh, crazy because uh, sen uh, up until now they wanted the Senate to work as fast as they can to put, it, put the, the, the voting laws in the same as, as fast as they can and now they are kind of trying to make it uh, to, to, to prolong this. So I don't understand what it means, but they've mm. said many times already that the 10th of May is not so possible. Uh, but yeah, that, that's just the moment of craziness, I, I would say. But, but <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't know what it means. Maybe it means they want to, do, to, have, uh, to have the elections like in two weeks or something like that. But huh. just the general information, looks, it looks like, like they actually don't want to do the elections on the 10th of May. And we are, today is which one? The fifth? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Okay, that's it. An that's interesting the, update. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have to deal with uh, possible scenarios here, uh, which are all uncertain. But I'd just like the, you know, the audience to see that there's this, uh, there's a very complex situation to relate to for the other EU states or uh, more broadly European states, right? So we, we have, a very uh, disturbing, uh, uh, consistent attempt to capture uh, the, 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 the legal system by the government. Mm -hmm. We have uh, democratic elections, which should be going on autonomously in each state and not be interfered with. Uh, now it's tricky because of uh, the health risk uh, during the, uh, the epidemic. Um, and then we have the expectation of very dire and extensive uh, economic uh, uh, circumstances for large part of the population in, in Europe and perhaps especially in those states which do not have such a solid buffer to handle a crisis as for instance Norway or, or Germany or, or some, of the, some of the more fortunate ones. So this is a very tricky situation and and what can we expect? Uh, what are the options? Uh, uh, I'm hoping that Wojciech can help us see through this fog and, and into this future, which will probably affect us all. So, please. Thank you, Iver. Uh, it's an impossible task. And by the way, how much time do I have? <laughs> 
how said? much how much time do I have for this? <laughs> oh wow. Let's see, five to ten minutes. Five to ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Uh, thanks. Um, so yeah, the the, the situation uh, concerning election uh, seems to be intertwined with the judiciary and the system of the rule of law in Poland. Um, as in many other constitutional democracies, we have a system in which the Supreme Court ultimately verifies and validates the electoral results. So um, in this particular circumstances that we've been already touching upon, it is the, the institution of the last resort to verify, to validate whether uh, the vote that is going to take place at some point has been has met all the democratic standards constitutional standards that include transparency uh, ubiquitous uh, the, the the element of, of everyone participating in it in, in a free and fair process mm. um, you rightly pointed out to this uh, moment that at the end of april uh, Małgorzata gersdorf the the uh, first president of the supreme court was, I mean, she, uh, she ended uh, her term, uh, seven year term, despite pressure uh, from the government previously to end her term earlier, she did not uh, uh, succumb to this pressure and she continued until the very last day and then she retired. Now we are in a moment in which the president uh, will have an opportunity to nominate the next president of the Supreme Court, but still we do not know when it will happen. The commissioner, the um, acting president of the Supreme Court, appointed temporarily to, uh, to fill the post, uh, has to organize internal elections, and this process will take time. As we are discussing elections, it all, it all depends, in politics it always, everything depends on timing. Timing is everything. So um, the longer this process takes place, the more um, confusion there is about uh, the Supreme Court's uh, role and uh, in the process of, of judiciary. But the more elections are postponed, and as Marta already indicated, it's pretty obvious that uh, election cannot take place, the election cannot take place on Sunday, 10th of May, because of logistical problems and also because uh, PIS started finally to admit it. They would, uh, knowing the record, uh, track record of this party, they could have tried to go with the vote at some point, uh, just against the tide. They've been quite known for, for opposing uh, the, the, the majority in various ba battles, uh, political and legal battles before. And sometimes they were successful in pushing forward their agenda or, while defying norms and laws that uh, are generally accepted across Europe. But in this case, I th it seems that they are saying no to 10th of May and they are entering uncharted territory, uncharted constitutional territory. Their defense line on the 10th of May was that everything goes by the book. The Speaker of the House has uh, the mandate to set the date, but nothing, there is no word in the Constitution that would say that the Speaker of the House can change the date. So if we're talking about another day uh, throughout May, there is no wording in the Constitution that would give the right and uh, uh, autonomous decision of the Speaker of the Parliament to move it to another, uh, to another day. Although the government already expects to have a new law that is going to be processed uh, in same um, in two days until the end of this week, which could allow that as a law that, that will be controversial. Yet another controversy uh, with the EU regulation. The controversy because it's unclear and, and several constitutional lawyers say it's impossible for the speaker of the of the parliament to change that date still within the margin of uh, uh, of uh, of the days that are set ahead of uh, vacation 
of the Office of the President that will take place no later uh, than on the 6th of August, unless the government, uh, uh, unless the government invokes a state of natural disaster. And then the office, um, the, the term of the office uh, gets automatically extended because of the state of natural disaster. So you see there are many moving puzzles and I will not go much further into that, but I guess your question was also hinting to what will be the, the possible uh, reaction on, on behalf and what, what will be the pot potential conflict area with, with the EU. Mm. I do not think that there will be much uh, of a conflict uh, with the EU overall, unless the government really makes it sloppy with uh, the procedures. And there are many indications that they are already trying to do that. If election does not take place as scheduled and uh, the state of natural disaster is invoked, there is uh, gener generally there would not be any controversy. However, we have uh, already heard from OSC mission, uh, Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, uh, very critical remarks on the process of changing electoral law uh, during electoral campaign ahead of the elections, presidential election. And therefore, you can see, you can expect a lot of condemnation should the government uh, try to pursue through, to, 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 to push through elections uh, based on such law. The political repercussions, of course, might be severe. I wouldn't go as far as to say that Poland might be excluded from the EU. More likely scenario would be, in my opinion, that uh, presidential elections would need to be repeated. Again, we're coming back to point number one, which is the Supreme Court. And uh, Supreme Court will have to validate the elections. If there is international pressure, and more importantly, general, pu pu uh, general public understands that the process was not right, was not um, conducted as election in democratic uh, country should have been conducted then and the Supreme Court also rules on that that the election need to be partially or completely uh, repeated then you may have simply another election with another legal complication but perhaps the very same candidates running again mm -hmm. and that's not a situation unique in the European Union if you remember uh, completely different, different circumstances uh, in Austria uh, that led to three subsequent election being uh, repeated simply because of uh, a very bad preparation of, of the government to run election and government and the electoral office to, um, to run the government, to, to run election for the president of the Republic of, of, of Austria. That situation didn't take much, um, I mean, it, it was a couple of years ago only. Finally, the result was uh, a withdrawal of a far-right or defeat of the far-right candidate that initially had a, um, had a, a, a margin of, uh, a safe margin of, uh, for victory, and then he was uh, slipping down on the, on the electoral slope with several uh, repetitive elections. I wouldn't say that this might be the situation in Poland, but I'm trying to put it in the perspective that the situation in Poland, given the situation in pandemic, will allow many EU member states that do not seek uh, uh, immediately a conflict with Poland, especially in times of pandemic, and especially on such a delicate uh, issue, if Poland is actually um, showing that any misconduct during elections was not planned and was not an organized um, takeover of power, but it is actually, um, you know, a sloppy situation during understandable uh, circumstances. The last scenario, perhaps, the, the most worrisome and the most alerting, but less, the, the least likely, is that uh, um, government would not hear to any of those protests and would simply go ahead with confirming their candidate through questionable election. That naturally would result in uh, protests, not only from the opposition, but contested um, uh, opinion across the society. And importantly, 
uh, among partner countries, not only in Europe, but the United States as well, the main partner for security reasons for Poland um, versus or vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the threat from, from Russia. Such questioning of, of the procedure and, um, um, and, uh, and questioning from international partners on who uh, the, the security of Poland depends would be the ultimate pressure point for a government should this worst scenario uh, be underway and, uh, 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 and would be threatening the, the constitutional and democratic order in Poland. Maybe I stop here. Mm. Yes, I see no questions. Um, it's uh, I, I have sympathy for for that, given the complexity of the subject and, and the, the uncertainty of the situation. I'd like to pose one, uh, however, for anyone to answer as as as, as best they can. Um, um, uh, maybe we should, you know, make the obvious point. Uh, for parts of the opposition and and for uh, uh, a large part of, of uh, human rights oriented civil society in Europe. Uh, one thing is uh, the risk that uh, uh, an election is carried out with uh, which provides a very low uh, degree of legitimacy, democratic legitimacy to to the likely winner, which is the incumbent president, uh, Anders Ey Duda. Uh, but the next, the next step is probably what, uh, what worries many even more, right? That uh, the presidential uh, position is very important to uh, secure um, uh, the continued uh, project of, of assuming control over the, over the judiciary. So, so the president uh, will choose the new first president of the of the supreme uh, court uh, uh, and um, uh, the government already seems to have a, a high degree on, on uh, the constitutional tribunal um, and these posts the constitutional tri tribunal uh, uh, and, and the presidency and, and the ministry of justice they are opposing this uh, 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 the judgment uh, judgments made by the European Court. Uh, so the European Court uh, claims, uh, at least by implication, that uh, that uh, several subdivisions of the Supreme Court uh, are uh, not satisfying the the criteria of independence that uh, every member state must satisfy. That goes for the disciplinary chamber and the extraordinary uh, chamber, which will judge on on uh, electoral disputes. Uh, so there are uh, and also a new law, the so-called Muscle Law, which which constrains how how uh, uh, judges may uh, act and speak. Uh, so we have ongoing processes which almost certainly will lead to final convictions in the European court. Uh, and that's, those are decisions that will be head, uh, a head on collision with the, the sustained ambitions of, uh, of the Polish uh, government. Uh, and uh, well, with uh, a majority in parliament and the president uh, and the constitutional court on their side, uh, it's it's very uh, difficult to see how this frontal collision uh, can be avoided between the EU and and the Polish uh, government and and, uh, and what could that lead to? All outcomes of that seem very troubling, either for Poland or for the European system or for both. So so uh, how do you see? Uh, is it possible for the EU to find a way of handling this expected or developing frontal collision uh, with the Polish government in uh, in a way which doesn't, you know, harm either the EU or Poland very badly? Is there a strategy that could work? Difficult. 
who, who is supposed to answer the question? Well, anyone who might give us some sound advice. I think uh, the, the state of, uh, I think pressure in Poland on declaring the state of emergency, uh, as it's actually in, in, it's actually happening. We have restrictions on movement. We have all kinds of restrictions. We have epidemic restrictions. So uh, it, it's something that would let peace keep the face, as I can say. Uh, because when we have state of emergency, uh, the, the elections cannot be held, even if they were announced earlier. So this is the, the this is the law that we actually can base on uh, that elections just won't happen because because of the state of emergency. And then 90 days after the um, after the the state of emergency ends, uh, the elections can be announced and then can be held in, at, at some point in time. And uh, and I think, basing on the fact that we have uh, the restrictions that are only that can only be assigned during the state of emergency, that, that, that are actually uh, illegally set now, like restriction of movement. The constitution says that uh, the restriction of movement cannot cannot happen until this the one of the state of emergencies. Um, this is something that would, m might work actually, uh, and as I say, it would let the government keep the face, but. Uh, after the epidemic ends, as I said, we will have the, uh, the the economic crisis, and they just might want not to hold, you know, not to hold elections in the time that will be bad for them, uh, or they can also pro prolong the state of emergency as long as they want, because this is the government declaring that this is the this is their uh, their decision. But this is the only way I see for it to make it not uh, so we don't create more legal chaos, actually. Mm. And I think it would be quite easy on the, the, the smart people in the European institutions and in Europe uh, to prove that we have state of emergency that is just not declared in Poland and it should be declared with all the consequences, including the consequences about elections. And yeah, it's it's the only the, the, as as we talk about elections because with the judiciary uh, independence, I think it's totally different, something totally different. Right, so that would that would kind of stabilize the situation and and, and, yeah. and secure a legal ground uh, yeah. for um, uh, for the emergency decisions. Uh, what then uh, do you think would happen and should happen uh, if the Polish government simply ignores the the rulings of the European uh, Court of Justice? Uh, mm rulings intended to, to stop the operation of, of disciplinary persecution of, of uh, judges um, and, um, and uh, there will likely be, be uh, other, uh, mm. other actions that, uh, that uh, clearly uh, will be contrary to... Um, to uh, I, I see two to things. Uh, one thing I see that uh, because this is the plan that we actually have to prepare uh, really massive uh, if, if the elections are held during these times now or a week uh, or next week or, or at some close time now without declaring the state of emergency uh, we are preparing the not to us it's bonus on the, the, the judiciary uh, organization um, to to do the massive action on uh, election protests that are being actually uh, put that, that, that are um, claimed to the Supreme Court. So we will need like a half a million of them or a million people actually protesting the outcome of the elections if they are held. And if the Supreme Court, because there is a new chamber that is supposed to, to declare if the elections were, were uh, held properly or not. Um, mm -hmm. So if this chamber uh, breaks the law and yeah, basically I'm sure they will, this is the, the matter of reaction of, uh, of the European Court of Justice, of European institutions. Uh, if the ruling of the Supreme Court will be obviously, um, obviously wrong and by the chamber that shouldn't be dealing because the chamber shouldn't work as the, the European Court of Justice uh, declared some time ago that, that this chamber shouldn't be working at all. Um, so this is about the elections. And the second about the disciplinary actions, I think it's the, it's, it's the economic pressure, it's the fines, it's the cutting the funds, uh, hold, or with withholding, not, not not maybe not cutting the funds, so it's harder to get them afterwards. But uh, kind of claim declaring them and then withholding them because of the uh, the Poland not obeying the tribunal, the, the the European Court of Justice rulings. 
So these are the two things that I have in mind for us, for the, for the elections for trouble and for the judiciary independence trouble. So making us even poorer, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But yeah, we have to deal with this. this. There's no other way. Well, it's tempting then to round off with, uh, you know, a question that would be particularly relevant in Norway. As you know, Norway uh, controls uh, separate funds under the EEA agreement, um, uh, going to various parts of, of, uh, uh, of uh, social life in, in, in Poland. Um, parts of those funds have been suspended, namely the funds uh, going directly to uh, projects run by the Ministry of Justice. So the Norwegian government has declared that uh, uh, the unwillingness of the Ministry of Justice to adhere to uh, you know, basic norms of, of rule of law uh, uh, has broken the trust necessary to, uh, to negotiate uh, 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 how these funds will be uh, spent and they have uh, suspended uh, the transfer of these funds uh, indefinitely. However, there are uh, other parts of, the, of this large fund going to other government-run activities and, uh, and also parts going to civil society. Uh, is there, sh sh should Norway, you know, uh, uh, take a stronger stance here? Uh, maybe suspend a broader uh, portion of, uh, of, the, of the funding? Uh, um, or is there some other constructive role that, that the Norwegian government could, could take to, to, to play a part uh, and hopefully make uh, the odds a little better uh, uh, for how this plays out? Uh, should, maybe I, uh, should, uh, should I maybe uh, answer that uh, question? Um, um, well, answer and answer. Well, as I see it, uh, unless we can be absolutely sure that those funds are going to civil society or to such goals as research, development, innovation, um, they have to be suspended because we cannot risk that those funds end up uh, at uh, governmental yeah. uh, institutions. So no way that this money should be used like this. And uh, believing that, oh, maybe we should be, um, uh, well, we should maybe negotiate or try to encourage or it really doesn't work like that uh, with this government. Uh, so it's, well, I mean, it's enough of explaining and asking and requesting and encouraging, uh, showing goodwill. That's just enough. So, um, and actually those funds uh, are paid by Norway uh, because Norway is a member of the internal market. So that's one of the consequences. Mm. And those funds should be spent on something that is um, inherently against European cooperation, against European solidarity, against European values. I mean, it's pretty much at least strange, I would say. Yeah. So, um, no way, Un unless we really are sure that those funds are going to those who should get them. We have transparent uh, procedures and uh, it's a civil society that is getting the funds. So. A final word from from Wojciech. We're strictly ordered to, to close off at, at two, so uh, you'll have a sentence or, or, or three or four, if you like. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I don't think that the Norwegian government has a, has a money leverage on, uh, on the Polish government in that respect. Uh, so if you consider the portion of the budget that is uh, contributed to this mutual cooperation um, within, the, within the agreement between Polish government and whatever other member states, of EU on, on uh, contributing to, to bettering the governance um, and co uh, cohesion of, of, of European e economic space, there isn't, there isn't really a, a great solution. And I wouldn't expect much pressure is coming from such activity. Though, of course, it would be uh, whenever, the, like in the case of Ministry of Justice, it is hard to 
not to put a strong question mark and sometimes suspend, suspend a cooperation because of the standards that are clearly uh, visible so you, you cannot participate or anyone cannot participate um, in cooperation with a partner that doesn't respect basic rules of democracy or rule of law. Um, what, what is important, however, it are, for Poland are the, the security instruments. Uh, Poland's political class and Poland overall as a society is very sensitive to the question of security. And security needs to be broadly understood, not only as hard security like tanks, rockets, but the system of international norms and standards. And the pressure from international institutions Poland is member of EU, but not only OSC, NATO, that Norway is also, also present in those uh, institutions, is a, a key diplomatic instrument for dialogue and, and cooperation on, on resolving the issue that may threaten otherwise the stability of security in the region. Hmm. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a great pleasure. I'm ordered to cut us all off. Um, but it's, um, it's been uh, very enlightening to me. Uh, a fair number of details that uh, I think matter. Uh, uh, I wish you all the best and all, or all of us, because I, my conviction is that the destiny of Poland, the developments of Poland are incredibly important for Europe. I agree fully that they're probably uh, more important for Europe and for Norway than the British situation. So uh, let's uh, cross our fingers uh, for the next few days that uh, we'll avoid disaster. Uh, and hopefully we can get back and continue this discussion another time. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.